by your name. Thank you, mighty God. Jesus. Come on, in the auditorium and at home, why don't you just lift your hands. And just begin to breathe in the Holy Spirit. Just say, Holy Spirit, we want more of you right now. Holy Spirit, we're just so hungry for you. Oh, Lord Jesus, we pray right now. Come and invade our lives with your power. Come and invade this room and every household that's watching right now with the presence of your power, Lord God, your Holy Spirit. Come on, why don't you just speak out in the language of the Holy Spirit right now. Come on, you just keep singing it out right now. Just begin to speak in the language of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. I just see made like just massive walls, concrete walls. And I just see that as we begin to speak in tongues, and it's not by might, it's not by power, so it's not about volume and any of that, but as we just begin to speak in tongues and hunger after his presence and yield and surrender to the Holy Spirit. I just see those barriers. I don't know whether they're barriers or obstacles or challenges, but I just see those things crumbling. If the Bible says that the mountains melt like wax in the presence of the Lord, and I just see those walls just beginning to be broken down, those barriers, those obstacles are being broken down by the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's begin to go into that again in an instrumental. And as we do, I want you to just, wherever you are, if you're at home, if you're in this room, you just begin to lift your hands, begin to hunger after His presence. Begin to say, Holy Spirit, I want you more than anything else. Holy Spirit, I'm so hungry for your power. I'm so hungry, Lord Jesus. Begin to yield and surrender your life to Him. Surrender your life to Him this morning. We yield, we surrender to your spirit, Holy Spirit. We surrender to your power, Holy Spirit, your presence right now. Just speak the name of Jesus over your life in this place. Just speak the name of Jesus over wherever it is, whatever blockage there may be in your life. The name of Jesus is the name that is above every other name. Jesus, we lift you up this morning. Jesus, we worship you this morning. Jesus, we look to you this morning. Jesus, we honor your presence right now. Almighty God, we're hungry, Holy Spirit. Lord, I'm hungry. Ben, can you just pass me my phone? If you're at home and you want me to pray for something right now, then just put a prayer request on the phone and I'll see it. And we've got about 20 people here this morning. We're going to pray for it. And we're going to believe for a miracle. We're going to believe for healing. We're going to believe for transformation. We're going to believe for a move of the Holy Spirit this morning. So come on, we're not here to go through the motions. We're not here for performance. We are here to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And wherever God is, He brings with Him all of heaven, His miracle-working power as well this morning. So if you've got a prayer request, usually I do prayer requests. You write them in the uh, foyer there, and then you bring it up. So we're going to do it right here, right now. So if anyone's got a prayer request, just put it here on the phone. And I'll say, I know you're about a few seconds behind. Put them in there. Lisa Thompson. Yes, want the Holy Spirit. You want to hunger for Him. So pray for strength, wisdom. Yes, we will do that. Any other prayer requests that that you have this morning? If anyone needs a healing, If you're in the auditorium and you need healing, just lift your hands. If you're online and you need healing, just drop the line and just say, yes, I need 
God's healing power this morning. Yes, pray for Craig and Donna's health. They need a healing. Yes, pray for someone's written here for Alicia. Uh, pray for no migraines. They're going through migraines every single day. Keep coming them in. We're, good. We're believing that God is a miracle working God. Pray for Wednesday, court. As someone who's got court case about seeing their daughter, we need a miracle there. Someone's praying for people with uh, needs pr- uh, healing from mental illness. Uh, Trevor from Wakeree is having surgery tomorrow. Let's believe that that will go well. So many people writing in. So right now, let's lift up every prayer request in this room. Let's begin to pray and believe that God, nothing is impossible with God. For man, yes, things are impossible, but for God, no things are imp- no things are impossible. So come on, someone's believing for their son this year to speak. He's turning five and he doesn't speak, believing for words right now. So in the name of Jesus, come on, lift your voices, lift your faith this morning. In Jesus' name, we speak over Craig and Donna. Let your healing power flow this morning. I speak for those with mental illness. I speak over those who have caught tomorrow. I speak over that five-year-old child that cannot speak. I declare that words will come out of their mouths in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, I pray, come and touch every need. Come and touch every hungry heart. I pray for every person who needs healing this morning. Let your healing power flow. We believe, Lord Jesus, that you purchased our physical healing when your back was whipped by that whip, Lord Jesus. And so right now, we declare that by your stripes, we are healed in Jesus' name. So let your healing power flow. Let the blood of Jesus flow right now. Lord Jesus, for those who have mental illness, I speak breakthrough in the name of Jesus. For those who are having surgery tomorrow, I declare peace in that person's mind, that all would go well in Jesus' name. I declare let miracles take place this morning. Jesus, we believe it. Jesus, we honour you right now. We honour your presence, Jesus. See if I missed any. Complete healing. We've got many prayer requests on YouTube as well. Sorry. Lots of prayer requests coming through. So I'm going to read these out. Someone needs complete healing of their feet. Sue, we're believing for you. They're not needing bunion surgery. Someone's believing for healing from blood pressure in the children. Someone else is believing over here for my children to return home. Someone else is believing for a little boy in hospital to be healed. Someone else is believing for peace across the globe. People are dying. Pray for world peace. Someone else is believing to against fear. Someone else who needs healing for vertigo diagnosis. Someone else for fear to be gone in Jesus' name and peace to fill every single heart. Someone else believing as sickness be healed, needs be met, and people will be delivered in Jesus' name. Somebody else are believing for a mighty, ple- they're ble- pleading the mighty blood of Jesus over everything that needs healing, health, and wholeness in every area of their lives in Jesus' mighty name. So right now, let's just one more time lift every single prayer request to Him. Let, actually, I'll hold this. Sorry, Ben. I'm going to hold this, and we're going to bring them before the throne room of God. Present our request to God. So Jesus, right now, you see every need. You see every prayer request that's come through. And Lord Jesus, we present these needs to you. We present these burdens to you. We present these cares, these worries, these sicknesses, these illness, these financial problems, Lord God, to you. We acknowledge that we can't do it without you. We acknowledge that in our own strength, we cannot overcome. And so right now, we need you to move in every situation. We need you to take control in every situation. We need that. We plead the blood of Jesus over every illness. We plead the blood of Jesus over every impossible situation. And I ask that you come and give us faith. I thank you that when we don't have enough faith of our own, in Corinthians it says that you give us some of your faith. And I pray that you would deposit mustard seeds of faith in people's hearts to believe that nothing is too hard for you. So we declare and speak the blood of Jesus over every single need right now. Come and touch every person we pray. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, thank you, mighty God. Thank you, mighty God. 
Jesus, we're hungry. We're ready to hear your word this morning. We're so expectant for the words that you've placed in Pastor Paul's spirit. We're so expectant for the word that you've placed in his heart that he's about to bring this morning. So I pray that you would remove every single barrier. I pray that the seed, Lord God, would fall on good soil this morning, that it wouldn't just be on the surface, but it would dry deep, Lord God, that it wouldn't just be information, but let it be revelation that produces fruit in Jesus' name, we pray. So we're so expectant for your word. We're hungry. We're open. We're full of faith. We're ready in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen, amen. Why don't you give him a hand of praise here this morning and in your homes. Let me just have a look where you are. Oh, accidentally logged out. I'm back. Still prayer requests coming through. We've declared them. We pleaded the blood over them. And I'm believing for healing and miracles and great testimony from this moment in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Well, I've got two crowds here. I've got the one here. You guys can sit down. And I've got the ones online. I don't know what you at home. Make sure your kettle has already prepared what you need. Yes, we pray for eradication of COVID-19. Divine solution to the pandemic. I speak it out for families to be reunited, for lives to be spared, for economies to revamp, for hunger to be averted. Lord Jesus, wash our world in your blood. Heal nations, Father, in Jesus' name. We we declare that you would heal racial tensions in Jesus' name. Cleaner, keep it coming. I declare right now. See, I see we are one race. We are the human race. There's no African race or Asian race or Australian race. It is one race. It's called the human race. We are one. And so right now I pray that you would heal the racial tensions that are going on right now. Bring peace to this world. Lord God, I thank you that your son Jesus actually mended us and brought us together and gave us a deeper point of connection that now we are all brothers and sisters in Christ in the same family, I pray. Heal that racial tension in Jesus' name. We need the healer, the giver, the protector. Only you, Lord. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Father. We believe your stripes. All sicknesses shall be healed. Amen. We pray for Pastor Paul this morning. Thank you, Marie. We honor Pastor Paul. We pray for him right now. Anoint his word in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord, we believe that. Have your way in people's lives. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I'm only reading from Facebook. I know there's a lot more on YouTube. But we're speaking that out in faith, believing for an incredible one. It's going to be, um, can I just say, a lot of people have said, oh, you know, now, now it's forcing the church to get out of the four walls. Yes, that's important. But let me tell you, there's nothing like coming together and worshiping Jesus. <laughs> I can tell you right now, if you were in the room, you would feel what I'm, what I'm saying. There's just something supernatural that takes place when the the body of Christ assemble together and lift up the name that's above every name, the name that is Jesus. Something supernatural takes place. Can I tell you, I feel so much more faith in my heart by being here this morning. Now, doesn't mean I'm not praying during the week. I'm absolutely praying. I'm absolutely reading the Word. I'm absolutely speaking in tongues as much as I can. But guess what? When you come together, there's something that's so supernatural that you cannot create on your own. That when, you know, Phil and Mary's faith and Dawn and Lloyd's faith and Alyssa and Pastor Paul and Steve and Tony and Joe and, and, and uh, Linda and Nikki and Bob Dan and Christina and the, uh, Phil's and, and uh, Kitch I think I've got, and Reese, when you guys come and bring your faith, it adds faith to the atmosphere and something supernatural takes place. That's why I believe now I know why the Bible says do not forsake the gathering of the brethren because something powerful takes place. Can I tell you? Yes, Lord, we are one. Mark 12, 31. Your commandment is that we love one another. Teach us how to love, Lord. Yes, amen. Heaps more coming through. But what was I saying? The, the, do not forsake the gathering of the brethren. Oh, I, I totally understand that to another level. See, going to church 
doesn't make you a Christian, but going to church definitely keeps you a Christian. I can tell you that right now. You've heard that before, but it's so true. It was so cliche to me, that statement, because I don't think I've ever not been in church for 12 weeks in my entire life. I've never, ever, I've never in my entire life have I not been in church for 12 weeks. And I can tell you, I've never felt what I felt. I've been to conferences and camps, and yes, they're powerful, and yes, there's an unleashing of the supernatural of God, and that's different, but something was here this morning that was just incredible. It was, it was Jesus was here. And, and what he does in a group of people is so different. You can't get it individually. And that's why God, he says, it's not good for man to be alone. He created us to be in community and in community lifting up the name of Jesus. You cannot create this at your home. It's so powerful how good God is. And so I'm so hungry for the word. If you're new online, welcome. But we can't wait. Can I just say, I haven't discussed it with all the, well, we've preliminarily discussed it with the eldership. So I think I can say it now that we will be going to two services uh, from the, not next week, but the week after with all the church gathering together. So we have one more week of sort of some people here at church. We have 75 next week. And the week after that, we'll have a church at 9 a.m. and a service at 10.30 a.m. And you can choose which one you come to, and that's for the whole church. We'll have enough room in the building. The restrictions will be lifted by then. Still need a social distance. We'll still have hand sanitizer everywhere. Uh, but if you're watching online, if you're new, can I just tell you, you've got to get to church here, 25 Northside Court, Evanston Gardens, something supernatural. I believe revival will break out. I, that's not cliche. I'm not just saying that. There was so much power. It sort of reminds me. I'm not going to preach. I'm going to give Pastor Paul as much time as he wants. But it actually sort of reminds me of how we can so become familiar with the presence of God. When we come to church every single week, we can become familiar with His presence and His power and the faith that's in the atmosphere. Let me tell you, that was, as much as I'm not, I try not to be familiar, oh, we're so familiar. But when we can't have that, and then when we come back after 12 weeks, you go, wow, I've missed this. We've got to be as Christians. I think the key to stay hungry for God is to stay sensitive to the Holy Spirit and to stay soft-hearted, just to not allow disappointment and, and things to harden your heart. But if you can stay soft and open and sensitive, that's a, a major key to His presence and revival breaking out. This year is a year of personal revival. Remember, these last 12 weeks have not been isolation. It's been preparation. Because when you come back, there's going to be a spark. The fire of God is going to fall. Revival is going to break out. Souls are going to be saved in Jesus' name. So if you're new, get ready. Join us, 25 Northside Court, Evanston Gardens. All right, we're going to go straight to... Have I got any announcements that I've missed? No one knows because we're all sort of... Do I have any announcements missed? No, don't know. All right, let's quickly do the giving in two minutes and then Pastor Paul will have at least 45 minutes at least, so get ready, plenty of time. Um, yes, amen, I'm getting distracted now by the comments, I should put it away. But we're coming around a time of giving, and uh, Linda, can you just pass me that giving slip, Pastor Linda, from there? And I uh, want to thank you, church. Really, you have been incredibly generous over these last 12 weeks, and thank you for every person who's transitioned to online giving. And for our campuses, remember... It's so important to continue to give uh, in this season uh, because in terms of, you might, you might think, oh, well, you know, there's not as many expenses because we're not meeting. Well, guess what? <laughs> the expenses are exactly the same whether we're meeting or not. And so it's very, very important to continue to tithe, continue to give. So many way to give, credit card. You can give online at encounterchurch.com.au, credit card there. Text giving is my option, my way of giving, and I cover the costs of the fees to give. And that number is 0429 422 341. And the majority of people have been given via direct debit. Our BSB 105009, account number 123490640. And also you can go to the bank and deposit cash at your bank branch with the direct deposit details. Uh, or you can come into the church 
and, uh, and give as well. So let me give you a few minutes. I'm not going to try and twist your arm to give. It's just a principle as Christians that we follow. We're tithe and we're generous and we give because it's a reflection of, of God's character. He first, he showed his generosity by giving his son. So he never asks us to do what he doesn't, hasn't done himself. Now I'm just going to jump off the stream for a second and do my text giving. Three, two, one. No, it hasn't come back yet. There it is. All righty. So let's hold your giving in your hand this morning. And uh, oh, I forgot to say, if you wanted to have cash here for those who are here, I'll have an organizer. We can just organize it after. That's fine. Or credit card slip, whatever. All good. All right. Let's hold our giving in our hand and let's uh, pray that God blesses the seed. Heavenly Father, we thank you. So thank you for your presence. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you that the privilege of it is to gather together and do church. We thank you for the privilege of being able to sow and give into your kingdom. That we can partner with your work here on the earth. So thankful, so honored I get to do that. So Heavenly Father, take our seed this morning. Bless it and multiply it. Use it. We partner with your works this morning here on the earth. Lord Jesus, thank you. You give seed to the sower. So as we've sowed the seed, replenish the seed with more seed, we pray. Bless us as we give. And bless those who are on the receiving end of our giving this morning. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. Zoom meeting. So for new people, at the end of the service, if you want to have a chat with us, we have our Zoom meeting, 820212. 7747 and so you can meet with us there at the end of the service all right well we're going to have a look to the screen We've got a few announcements and then after that uh, honored to hear pastor what paul uh, preached the word this morning so let's have a look at that Good morning, church. It's great to be with you today. Thank God for technology. Um, I love church, and uh, to have been without church for all this time, if we hadn't got technology, it would have been so disappointing and I think a little bit soul-destroying. But thank God for technology, and then thank God that soon we won't be as dependent upon it. Uh, it's, it's good to be with you today. I, I want to speak to you today from the point of view of our church's uh, theme for the year, and that is that we are believing God for personal revival. Personal revival. To, to have personal revival is going to require a renewal of faith. Faith is so important, and if we're going to have personal revival, then we're going to have to have a renewal of faith. Faith is a developing element of life. Let's not complicate faith. Let's not make faith a really difficult thing. Let's not make faith something we have to strive to get. Faith is something that grows and develops. It grows and develops through the good and the bad of life. Whatever is going on in your life, all, every bit of it, has the possibility of developing faith in your life. It's like a seed. It germinates and it grows. I've just started a veggie garden at home and I 
planted a whole lot of vegetables and one lot of vegetables was radishes and the other was carrots and there's some others but they're my two favorites particularly to grow and um, without telling my wife I decided I'd have a little bit of fun in my garden so I planted the the radishes in a certain shape and uh, so I planted them in the shape of a heart and initially they started just a few come up and uh, they took a while by the way and it looked a little bit like I was drunk when I was planting the seeds the carrots look even worse but there's a surprise coming there as well but uh, eventually the heart came and Laureen saw it and oh wasn't it? We, it look it was a passionate moment but a seed has to germinate and grow and faith is just like that. Um, Pastor Chris mentioned earlier uh, to ask the Lord to have a mustard seed of faith because the Bible says that that mustard seed of faith will grow into a massive tree. And that's how it works. Life is like, uh, faith is like muscles. It develops under pressure. You know, if you want to develop your muscles, and some people do, um, then if you want to do that, you've got to lift weights and all that sort of thing. And once you get up to, like I'm up to about 250 pounds now, to, <coughs> um, <coughs> to, 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 to be able to lift more than you are able to now, you've got to actually put pressure on your muscles. You've got to lift higher, heavier weights, push harder, run faster, run longer, whatever it is. And so to develop faith, you've got to have some pressure. Now, Hebrews 11 is known as the faith chapter. And through these verses of, of Hebrews 11, you can learn so much about faith. Let's remember that all those people are called heroes of faith, but they didn't start out that way. They grew into faith. But I want to take you for a moment to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. If you've got a Bible, please open it up. I found it very helpful while I was sitting at home for the last few weeks to have a Bible available and to not only look up the Scriptures, but then to take notes. And boy, I've got some good sermons I can preach now. Um, <laughs> Hebrews 11, chapter 5. Turn with me there, will you? It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying I think you'd agree that would take a fair bit of faith he disappeared because God took him for before he was taken up he was, a no, he was known as a person who pleased God that's very important it goes into verse 6 and it says this and it is impossible to please God without faith now that sounds like a massive task, but let, don't get hung up on that right now. But it's impossible to please God without faith. But for Enoch to have the experience he did, he needed to have, and that faith demonstrated that he pleased God. It's impossible to please God without faith. Listen to this. Anyone who wants to come to him, that is God, anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him so that's how you get faith well that's how you, you develop the faith that's there that's how you do it first of all you need to believe that god exists and if today you're with us and not believing that god exists and wondering how in the world you got into this room that let me tell you all you've got to do is believe that he exists and you're on the path of faith towards pleasing god Mind you, you started pleasing God just by that. And then it goes on and it says, and you have to believe that he will sincerely reward those who seek him. When we read this passage, we usually emphasize the word seek. It sounds like a prayer meeting coming up. Oh, if you want faith, you've got to seek God. You've got to really get into his presence and you've got to cry out to him. And you've got to ask him for stuff and you've got to tell him stuff and you've got to, and you've got to, and you've got to, and you've got to. I want to read that little bit with a slightly different emphasis today. I want to read it this way. We need to believe that he exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Can you see the difference? Not just seek him, but seek him. Seek him rather than what he can do. God doesn't mind you having a shopping list. But he much prefer a relationship. 
You know, I go to the supermarket with my wife and we have a shopping list. I've got my little app that takes me up and down all the aisles and we get all the stuff we need. When I get to the checkout, I usually chat with the checkout people and, you know, talk to them. And if there's an opening, I say whatever I can get to say. But let me tell you, I don't really have a relationship with them. I've sought my wife for relationship. I seek these people for my groceries. And I know which I'd prefer. I don't know which one Laureen would prefer, but I know which one I'd prefer. I would prefer a relationship than the groceries. And so what we need to do is remember that faith may spark because of something God does, but it grows by relationship with Him. Experience is momentary. You might have a healing. You might have a provision. You might have other things from God. It's momentary. But true relationship can last forever. And that's where your faith comes from. A marriage... Forgive me, I'm in a romantic mood every day. I go and see this heart out there, you know, and it's getting bigger. And now I can even start to see the little radishes forming. So I'm getting real excited. Not only have I got relationship, but I've got radishes. <laughs> a marriage or a relationship will deepen or possibly even last if it's based, if it probably not deepen or possibly last, sorry, if it's based only on what the other party does for you. So let me go again. I'm hoping I don't get into trouble when I get home. But faith, not in just the Lord's provision or healing or mercy, but in Him as a person. So, you know, Laureen and I have a policy. Just in case you don't know, Laureen's my wife. Um, just wanted to make that very clear. Laureen and I have a policy. She cooks. I clean up. Now, you can call that sexist. You can call that whatever you like. I call it wisdom. I wouldn't look like this if I was doing the cooking. I wonder what I would look like. Um, <laughs> so we got this pile, and I do a jolly good job of cleaning up, by the way, so much so that she'll say, oh, where's that knife? And I'll say, it's in the dishwasher. I haven't even used it yet. Oh, okay. So I'm good at the cleaning up bit. But she cooks, I clean up. Now, if my faith in her is in her provision of good food. Forgive me, Lorraine, but I'm going to be disappointed on the rare occasion that her provision may not measure up to my expectations. Now, there was a time when she was cooking our meals back in our early marriage, and I forget the count. It got quite dramatic. It was something like eight out of ten nights she burnt the potatoes. Now, that could have been devastating. I love potatoes. That could have been destroyed, marriage destructive. That could have finished us because if you can do it eight out of ten nights, who knows what the rest of life's going to be like. But I just overlooked it. She just sort of scraped the burn off. We got through, and here I am, healthy and all. But you see, my faith wasn't in her ability to cook it was in her now it turned out she was pregnant and so you know sometimes if you know what's going on in the be behind the scenes then you realize that whatever's going on in your face isn't quite what it seems but my trust my faith was in her as a person not in her ability by the way she's a brilliant cook now and many of you probably noticed yesterday on facebook she put up that magnificent thing which was a rhubarb something or other yeah one of those um and uh and she got loads and loads of responses because of how good it looked and let me tell you and you're not going to find out it tasted magnificent but my faith isn't in that that was a bonus. That was a bonus. My faith is in my relationship with Lorraine. And if you want strong faith, faith that gets you through nights of burnt potatoes kind of faith, then you need to develop relationship with your God, not just in what he does. Oh, he does lots. But isn't it fantastic that he, does, that he loves us, but it's also fantastic that he is love. So faith 
in his, whatever it is for you, his healing, his provision, is actually a little bit selfish. What we need is to have faith in him, relationally. And when we do, it's amazing what can happen with our faith. You see, when things aren't quite what we think they ought to be, we can look past that and we can see the person who will never let us down, the person who loves us, the person who we know we'll be walking with for the rest of our lives because the other things don't matter as much. So it's a little bit like uh, faith is a little bit like a plant. If a, if a plant doesn't develop its root systems well, then in the heat of the summer sun, it's going to die. I've had a few like that. I've planted them, I've dug the holes, I've fertilized, I've watered, I've done everything I can. And after a year, they're dead. You pull them out of the ground and the roots haven't even de developed. And so with our faith, it's, it's important that we, we develop our, our roots deeper than just the experiences of life. I have seen people who have based their faith on what God does and it hasn't lasted for them. I've seen people experience amazing miracles but slip away from the Lord with the smallest disappointment because no matter how big the miracle is, it doesn't seem to, to satisfy when there comes the son of a disappointment. And one of the things that I get amazed with about God that, that I think we miss is that God actually has individually designed protective boundaries around us. And he moves them according to our strength. Remember, we have to be able to press more. We have to be able to walk harder, you know, whatever, to develop faith. Well, God has boundaries around our lives that he moves on an individual basis. It's not the same for you as it is for me. On an, I couldn't have handled, I don't think, the faith that Abraham needed to sacrifice his own son. I, I think that would have been overpowering for me. I mean, sometimes you do want to, the kids, but, but it would have been overpowering for me to have to do that. But Abraham had grown that far. He'd pressed that much. And he was able, that was a step for him, but he was able to go there because he trusted that much. But if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, it says these words. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13. The temptations of your life, are no different from what others experience. In other words, you go through stuff, others go through stuff. You know, you, you go through a problem, and I don't want to minimize your problem, but you go through a problem and say, oh, my life's worse than everybody else's. Well, I'll guarantee, wait a while and you'll find somebody who has it worse. I, I don't say that glibly. I don't say that to condemn. I don't say that to minimize your problem. I say that to tell you, let's look realistically at life. There are always people worse off than ourselves. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He, that's, that's, that's beautiful. That's part of who God is. Not what he does. He doesn't do faithful. He is faithful. As a result, we see faithfulness come through. But he is faithful. It says, and God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. The message puts it this way. He will not allow the temptation to push you past your limit. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. I, I was just thinking this morning as we sung Oceans about the Apostle Peter. when he stepped, Well, he wasn't an apostle in those days, but he stepped out of the boat. And he began to walk on the water. What a beautiful miracle. This is fantastic. And I'm sure it must have helped his faith as he bounced across the top of that water, heading towards Jesus over there somewhere. But suddenly, let's forget what happened. Suddenly, it happened. He begins to sink. And at that moment, he could have said, where's the God, the faithful God? How come I'm sinking in these waters? And off he could have gone and he could have dropped his faith right there. But Jesus proved his faithfulness 
and proved that he was willing to make a way out of, of every problem as he reached forward. We don't know how Jesus got there so quick, but he reached forward and he took Peter by the hand, hauled him out of the water and put him back in the boat. Because God was there even at the middle of the storm. When you are sinking, God was there. I'll guarantee, first of all, Peter bragged a lot about that. Did you see what I did? And all the disciples would have said, yeah, you sunk. But I walked. But I walked. And I think that would have been part of the faith. Though we see Peter falter a little later, I think it would have been part of the faith life of Peter that for years he would have thought, I walked on the water. But more than that, when I began to sink, Jesus was there right by my side. This is faith. The Apostle Paul, in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8, said these words. Three times I begged the Lord to take away the problem. Now, let's not get into what the problem was. I've got my theories on it. I wouldn't be allowed to say them on television. But uh, just because my wife doesn't like to hear me talking about her mother. Um, no, three times. She's a gracious, wonderful, beautiful lady. Mum, I love you. Um, three different times I begged the Lord to take it away, he says, whatever the problem was. And I, I think, you know, one of the reasons I don't think God told us what it is, I don't think Paul told us what it is, because you can put yours in there. Whatever your problem is, put it in there right now. Three times I asked Lord, the Lord to take away my bad back. Three times I asked the Lord to wait, take away all my debtors. Three times I asked the Lord to, to help me to be able to speak properly. Three times I asked the Lord to take away that thing that's on my mind that never lets me go. And each time, God answered. Isn't that beautiful? God answered. Every time he asked. Three times he asked. Three times God answered. You know what he said? Each time, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. Wow. Now, some of us would say, that's fine for you, God, but that's not what I wanted to hear. But you know what? That's probably the most powerful answer to prayer you can ever get. Because let's see what Paul says straight after it. So now, I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me wow you see the pressure of the trial whatever it was the pressure of the difficulty whatever it was made him understand that available to him was his God his gracious God oh yeah God gives grace but he's gracious it's his person that's who he is and out of it came this understanding of the graciousness of God that, that makes me strong in my time of weakness. And so now he can actually go around and say, <laughs> I'm sick, but boy, that's brought me close to God. Now, I'm not sure that we want to walk around like that. People are going to think we're a little bit, you know. But uh, the concept is powerful. One person in the scriptures that demonstrates great faith in God is Job. Man, what a man. Job chapter 1, verses 6 to 12. Now, the passage, the passage I'm going to read to you right now is a very challenging passage. If you've not read it or if you've not studied the book of Job, don't just study this piece. You've got to study the book of Job to get the picture. If you've not studied it, then please don't, don't let all the theological problems that it raises for you hold you back. Um, don't get distracted by those things. Let's look at the things that we can take away from this right now. Job chapter 1, verse 6. One day, the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord, kind of like a committee meeting, a staff meeting. And the accuser, Satan, came with them. Beats me. Let's move on real fast. Where have you come from, the Lord says to Satan. And so, by the way, God never asks a question because he wants the answer, or he doesn't know the answer. All right? He always knows the answer. He's wanting, whenever God asks a question, he wants to go deeper. Where have you come from, the Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord, I've been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. I'll bet he has. 
Verse 8, then the Lord asked Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? Listen very carefully to this. He is the finest man in all the earth. He's blameless. A man of complete integrity. He fears God and he stays away from the devil. I mean evil. Satan replied to the Lord. How dare he? But he did. Yes, but Job has a good reason to fear God. You have always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You've made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. But you reach out and you take away everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. What a challenge. So God says, this is where theology gets a bit difficult to work with right now. We don't have, this is not a Bible college right now, okay? Verse 12. All right. You can test him. It's exam time. You can test him, the Lord said to Satan. Do whatever you want with him, with everything he possesses. Do whatever you want. Notice this. With everything he possesses, there's a boundary. But don't harm him physically. So Satan left the Lord's presence. I want to just look at this passage for a few minutes and see how we can develop faith like Job. The first thing we need to do is realize, and I hope Job realized, I'm sure he must have, is realize that Job was trusted by God. Now, we're talking about faith in God. Job trusted God. Did you hear what God said about him? Have you noticed my servant Job? He's the finest man in all the earth. He's blameless. He's a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil. God trusted Job, so much so that he allowed the devil to give him an exam. And guess what? Job passed that exam. So the situation in Job's life wasn't because God disliked him. It wasn't a punishment for something he's done, you naughty person. It, was, it actually came out of God's extreme trust for Job. I remember growing up, my mum, every time she got a cold or didn't matter what happened, it was, I don't know what I've done to God to make him punish me like this. But that's not what this passage is telling us. This passage is telling us that God allowed Job to go through certain problems to prove that he was trustworthy and that God trusted him. It, hey, it may not make much sense to you, it makes a bit more to me, but not a whole lot. But you know what? This is God saying, I trust and I love Job. I know that it doesn't matter what happens to Job, he will still have faith in me. It was to be true to prove that Job could be trusted in tribulation. You see, difficulties are not always a tax on you. I, I, I know all the problems we have are in some way connected back to that evil one that Pastor Linda talked about earlier, the devil. I know that. But don't all the time think, oh, the devil's attacking me. Let's not give him more glory than he's worth. Let's not give him the, the idea that he's more powerful than our God. Sometimes the problems you face may be because God trusts you. It takes a bit of faith to get there. But I'm trying to lift you today. In Job 6 verse 1, Job said, that he didn't have the strength to survive. By now, he's lost his health. Lost everything he had and his health. And all that's left is for the devil to come back a third time and kill him. But he hasn't yet. And Job says, I can't survive. But if we read the story, and this is why I say, don't, don't get hung up on a chapter or a verse in Job. You've got to read the whole story right through, start to finish, and read it a few times. It gets a bit boring in the middle, but boy, when you grasp it, you grasp it. He said, I can't survive. But by the end of the book, we don't see him surviving. We see him thriving. We see him thriving. And, and some of that needs a bit of an explanation when you get into it to see how deep and powerful it is. But it's not survival. It's thriving. The second thing we need to notice very carefully is that as the situation unfolded, and it did keep unfolding, Job survived because of two things. Number one, 
he recognized the sovereignty of God. I think, again, Pastor Chris preached on this earlier this year, on the sovereignty of God. He recognized the sovereignty of God. Sovereignty of God boils down to simply a few words, God's the boss. The kingdom of God is not a democracy. You don't get to vote on who the king is. And even if you do, your vote won't affect anything. So if you want to be part of the kingdom of God, it's not a democracy. God's the boss. The beautiful thing about this is that we, we see worlds like that in our, in our earth. We see countries where he's the boss or she's the boss. They're corrupt. They're despot. They're, they, they, they kill their own people and all that. The beautiful thing about this is that that's not what God's like. God is an incredibly great benefactor. He, he does what every monarch should do and that is he looks after the welfare of his subjects and if you get that into your mind it helps a lot he's the boss but he's on your side he's not out to make a lot of money out of it he's not out to just knock you around he's not out to destroy you and have a giggle this is not a comedy show for God God is very beneficial towards his people so let's have a back let's go back and see Job chapter 1 verse 20 so we've just had the he's all the servants have just come and told job you've lost everything your family your sheep your goats your donkeys your houses everything gone he was a very very rich man and it's literally all gone job 120 job arose he tore his robe and he shaved his head which is one of the things they would do back in those days some of you have gone some of the way to that by shaving your hair, but you don't tend to rip your clothes. Oh, some of the girls rip their knees now. Um, but uh, he rose, he tore his robe, he shaved his head, he fell to the ground, which I reckon most of us probably would have done. I've had enough. And worshipped. He worshipped. He worshipped. The loss of everything and he's worshipping God. And then he goes on to say, Naked, I came from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all of this, God did not sin, uh, sorry, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. He didn't say, what kind of God are you? Why have you done this to me? Who do you think you are? He fell and worshipped. They're powerful words and I read them out of an older version because they're more poetic and they are stronger that way. Naked I came into this world and naked I will leave. There's no tow bar on the back of a hearse there's no pocket in a shroud you can have all you want let me tell you bill gates and all of his friends put together when they go they'll go naked they might pick a nice suit out of his ward out of his wardrobe to put it on him but it's of no benefit anymore the lord gives thank you jesus for all you've given me and the lord takes away who do you no 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 God's sovereign, you see. God is sovereign. Blessed be the name of the Lord. After the second exam, I hate exams. Just done a few and I hate them. But two in a row, here comes the second one and he loses his health. And his wife comes to him and says to him, why don't you just curse God and die? That's an encouraging. I thank God for my wife wouldn't say that. She might say the same. No, she wouldn't. Why don't you curse God and die? Job 2, verse 10. Job replied, You talk like a foolish woman. Men, don't use that as an excuse. You'll never win. You won't win, okay? Don't even try going there. Just reading the Bible. You can't say everything that's in the Bible to, you know. You talk like a foolish woman. Listen to these words. Listen to these words. This is trust in the sovereignty of God. Should we accept only the good things from God, the hand of God, and never anything bad? I look like I understand all this stuff and really enjoy it. Let me tell you, I, 
I still struggle with some of it. But I've been living in the book of Job, not just reading it. And in fact, I haven't read it a lot for the last year or so. But I've been living in it just all the time. It's just going through my spirit, through my spirit. I think this is where the strength of Christianity lies. I think we've become weak Christians who, if God doesn't do the right thing or if he does the wrong thing by our eyes, we've got no faith anymore. People are leaving the church because somebody, something happened in their life that they don't understand. What they fail to understand is that God is sovereign. When you get this, it changes everything. Should we only accept good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? I know it's contrary to popular theology today. Theology for years now has taught us that God would never do anything bad. God's a good God. God loves you. He would never allow anything to happen in your life. And you know, some Christians, and my wife hates me saying this because she thinks it's too trivial, but you know, some people... They break a fingernail and wonder where God is in their life. Your car gets keyed in the car park and you, what in the world's God doing to me now? But, but if he gives you $10, you'll be getting up on the platform telling everyone, oh my God, my God. We've got to come to a point where we recognize God's in charge and he knows what he's doing. And if I'm going to develop stronger faith muscles, I'm going to have to have some pressure to lift. I, I, went, I went to the gym for three years. I, I still call him James, actually. We didn't get real close. <laughs> I, I went to the gym for three years, and I did all the lifting and all that, and I watched. And sometimes, you know, the coach was deliberately putting pressure on somebody's weights when they were trying to lift them or adding stuff on when they didn't want them to. What a cruel coach. We pay the guy, and he still does that just out to destroy us, to damage us, to affect us, to break our backs. And no, 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 no. The guy wanted stronger muscles. So the coach is helping him. Sorry, he's a trainer in the gym, isn't he? He's, he's helping him to get stronger muscles. You don't get them if you don't get some pressure. You want strong faith? You're going to have to have some pressure. Abraham had a lot more to face than the potential death of his son. He had a lot more to face. So we've got to accept that God is sovereign, but that he's a good sovereign. The second thing that made it strong for Job was that he had a very deep relationship with God. Now, to see this in the book, you do need to read the whole book of Job. You can't see it at a cursory reading of a few verses. You can't get to the point where Job's sitting on a pile of ashes, scraping boils off his body. His wife says to him, curse God and die, and say, yeah, well, that's what I reckon. The whole thing's a load of hogwash. You've got to go beyond that. You've got to read the whole story, start to finish. The boring bits in the middle, read them quickly, but come back later and read them again. You need to, you know, I, I remember my PA when I was pastoring here came to me one day and she said, I read the book of Job through just recently. I've read the book of Job through four times. And I don't get it. And I said, neither do I. Let's sit down and talk about it. And I preached four sermons out of that because suddenly I was forced to dig into the book. But Job had incredibly lengthy conversations with God. He asked God's questions. He asked God questions. Some people think we shouldn't be allowed to do that. But he questioned God. God can handle your temper tantrums. Do you know that? He asked God questions, and God asked him questions. Where were you when? Many of his statements, if you read it with this lens on, I just saw this one day, it's, it's staggering. Many of the statements that Job makes as he goes through the middle chapters of the book are legal jargon, very strong legal jargon, where he's asking God for mercy. He realizes that he might have done some things wrong in his life, that he has to pay the penalty for it. He says things like, I know that when I stand before you, I haven't got a leg to stand on. My words, that's not legal jargon. I've got, I'm not going to get through. I'm going to be found guilty. I just can't make it. 
What I need is somebody who will mediate between me and you. Somebody who will stand and speak on my behalf. Somebody who will advocate for me. If that isn't pointing towards Jesus Christ, tell me what is. And it's there as Job pleads with his God. And he says, would you please appoint a mediator to me? For, one of the, for me, one of the clearest illustrations that God, that Job had as a deep relationship with God or that he loves God um, is when he comes into Job 19.25. So what he does is he recognizes that God has done everything possible to save him. He's done everything. There's no more God can do. He says these words, but as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and he will stand upon the earth at last. Now, we have to keep this in context. Job was written around about the same time as Abraham. So it's a long time before Jesus Christ. It's a long time before the scriptures are written. It's a long time before theology is formed. In fact, that didn't happen until guys like Augustine and so on in the early, uh, in the early whatevers, you know, a couple of thousand years ago, a few thousand. So how long? I don't know, back there somewhere. So it didn't happen until that. So this is thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. So we, we don't have all that stuff available to us. And yet Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, Lord, I've been pleading you for you for an advocate and so on, and I know you've already appointed him. My Redeemer is the one who's going to get me out of this. You've already appointed him to stand on my behalf, and one day he's going to stand on the earth. Now, that can refer to the second coming, I guess, but I, I think it can also come to the first coming when Jesus came and stood on the earth and became the Redeemer through his death on Jesus Christ, on the cross. Let me tell you today, if you're a Christian, and Jesus, therefore, died for you, and you have accepted that, and you are now saved, and you've had the benefit of salvation. If God never did one more thing for you, you should be eternally grateful. If he never does the healing, the provision, the saving, whatever it might be, you should be grateful that he's given you salvation. I just ain't gotten over getting saved. It's the best thing that ever happened in my life. And if nothing else was ever done by God, that proves he loves me and the kind of person he is. So in the middle of all the difficulties, in the middle of all the negativity, Job is still confident of the existence of God and that he will come to earth one day. And in that way, he's way ahead of his time and even way ahead of many modern day Christians because he understood. You see, he didn't have this written, but he understood what Jesus said in John 14, 16. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. Never leave you. The God I know, the God I love, the God I serve, made me a promise, and I know that he has kept it to the fullest degree. I will never leave leave you and I will never forsake you get that into your spirit faith is getting stronger you know if Job was a contemporary Christian he'd be singing all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God. Maybe the wrong key, but join with me, will you? All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness. Come on, sing it one more time. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am faithful, I will sing of the goodness of God. See, 
I've been a Christian now for just over 60 years. I know, I know what you're thinking, but I've seen some bad times. My wife's nearly died two or three times. We've had problems with children. We've gone through financial difficulties. But that chorus, when that came out a little while ago and we started singing it in church, I just, it blew my mind all my life. You have been faithful. I can look back and I can see the difficulties, but in hindsight, when you look back, you can see the goodness of God. Because how do I get to still be standing here? Um, you know, I, I, I seem to have had health problems for a lot of my life. And uh, we've worked pretty hard, so we kind of neglected ourselves a little bit. But I've just done a round of all the medicals, and they're all telling me, don't come back. Now, I, you know, the undertaker hasn't said that. <laughs> but all the doctors are saying, you're fine. You're fine. Fine specimen of health. Now I've got no excuse at home when I say to my wife, oh, I need some care. It's just terrible. And so all the times when I felt like I haven't been well, they haven't been death-type issues. I've survived, come through them well. We've been through some pretty tough financial times in the past. But I look back, I've got a house. I've got a nice house. It's not the dream home, but it's a nice house. I've got a car, it goes. And it goes well. Got a little bit of money in the bank. I'm so healthy, fed up well. <laughs> I look back, I see those difficulties and I see what God's taught and we've learned. All my life, all my life, he has been faithful. To understand the book of Job, you've got to go and look at the end of it. Job 42, verses 12 and 16. Now, some of this isn't going to make a whole lot of sense because you haven't read the book. But so it says, the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life. See, we kind of think Job had all these problems all his life. So Job blessed, God blessed the Lord. God blessed Job in the second half of his life even more than in the beginning. For now, he's got 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a thousand teams of oxen and a thousand female donkeys. Oh, that's going to keep you warm at night, I don't know. Now, if you go back and read the start, you'll find that's exactly double what he started with when the problems happened. And then it goes into verse 16, and there's a lot more around this that just shows the goodness of God. But verse 16, Job lived 140 years after that, living to see four generations of his children and grandchildren. Wow. That's amazing. Now, out of 140 plus, whatever had happened before, because he had adult children before, out of 140 years plus, whatever had happened before that, because it says after that he lived 140. This man's getting on a bit. And yet he can still look back and see the blessing of God in his life. Because all his life, God had been faithful. Through it all, Hindsight shows that God was with Job. And in James 5.11, we read this passage. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the, intent, the end intended by the Lord. Keep that in mind. God has an intended end for you. And though it may include somewhere down the track physical death, it, his intended end for you is to live with him throughout eternity and be able to say you are a just and merciful God. So you have heard the perseverance of Job and seen the intended end by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. See, in conclusion, Job's faith was not in what God does for him, but in the person of God. The things he does may help to build our faith, but it's getting to know him that develops deep, lasting faith. 
He's purchased our salvation through the death of Jesus. Accept that fact on the basis of God's love and heart towards you and build a relationship with Him. And in that way, you're going to grow real faith and experience ongoing personal revival. Lord, I just ask you right now, help us to look beyond the circumstances of our life, though they, they may be large right now. There may be people out there that are suffering some huge things, people that are suffering financially right now. They just don't know where they're going to put the next meal on the table. They don't know how they're going to pay those bills. They hear about a, a water, water reduction um, bill, but they, they don't know how they're even going to pay the, the bill when it's reduced. There are people out there, Lord, who have sickness. They've just heard from the doctor that there's a condition in their body that they don't know how they're going to deal with it. Lord, and there are those out there that, that, that have relational difficulties with family members or whatever, and it's killing them, Lord. It's just destroying them. It's soul-destroying. But, Lord, I pray right now that you'll let them feel and sense your presence. Let them know who you are and let them look up and worship you. And say, naked I came, naked I go. You give, you take, but blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm prepared to accept the good and the bad from you because you're my sovereign God. And I know that you have an intended end for me. And you'll give me a way of escape through your grace from all of these things. Lord, just minister right now. Minister right now. Lord, go across the airwaves, through all the technology invade people's lives right now with your presence with your presence while you're there in an attitude of prayer right now if you don't know Jesus there's nothing better than knowing him once you really know Jesus all these other things fade into insignificance if you don't know him right now is a great time to get to know him all you need to do is ask him to forgive you for your sins. That's what Job was doing by putting on the, ripping his robe and, and falling on the ground. He was saying, I, I fall before you, God. You're in charge. And I love you. Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to give him your life. And as you do that, you're fine. He'll come into you. And the relationship will have begun. I'm going to pray a very quick prayer for you. You might want to repeat these words. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that you love me enough to die for me. I ask you to forgive me anything for anything in my life that may have offended you. Come into my heart. Become my Lord and Savior. I want to walk with you for the rest of my life. Thank you for hearing my prayer in your name. Amen. At the end of the service, which is about to happen, there's a Zoom room. A message will be on the screen to show you the number. And just type that number into a Zoom ID. And it'll take you straight into a room where there'll be people from the church. If you prayed that prayer, or if you, even if you just want to talk more about what's happened today, you don't have to make a commitment. You just want to talk more then give that, I was going to say number a ring, whatever you do with it, zoom yourself in there and have a chat with somebody. We'd love to be able to help you and to explain things to you more so that you can have a relationship with the God who we love that has been faithful for all of our lives. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Have a great week. Hey church, what a powerful time around the Word. We hope that God has invaded your home this morning, has blessed your family and touched your life. You know, don't forget this week, we've got 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. prayer every day on Facebook. Why don't you join us for that? Also, check out Pastor Chris's latest devotional. is outstanding content. And also, right now, who can you connect with? Who can you uh, text or phone? It is a great opportunity at the moment to create community in new ways. So be creative. See you soon. Have a great week.